soon after the heroic evacuation of British and Allied troops from Dunkirk in late May 1940. A film of British Expeditionary Force survivors arriving at billets in Halifax, produced by local cine enthusiasts, boasted, who said Hitler could stop us filming? During the first half of the 20th century, the film cameraman became an increasingly familiar sight at public events in Halifax, such as the Great Yorkshire Show, which included rare footage of a cameraman at work filming the action on Savile Park. The turn of the 20th century had seen the production of the first moving images in Halifax, when Bamforths of Home Firth filmed local volunteers leaving the Halifax barracks for service in the Boer War in February 1900. But the footage does not appear to have survived. Moreover, all that remains of a series of farce comedy films made locally by the Vanguard Film Producing Company of Halifax in 1914 is a copy of the title frame for one of the films entitled Wedded Bliss. However, from 1925, when the first royal visit to the town was recorded on film, a succession of evocative moving images is available to illustrate the changing history of the town from the 1920s until the late 1980s. From the 1920s to the 1980s, enthusiastic filmmakers were around to record for posterity both the momentous and the everyday events in the life of the local community. Their shots record high days and holidays. They record triumphs and tragedies. They record the changing townscape. And some of the momentous changes which have affected the lives of the people of Halifax in the 20th century. Intrepid camera teams filmed in all weathers. They were not deterred by torrential rain. They filmed in sub-zero temperatures. They clambered through drifted snow. They even filmed in scorching summer sunshine. They dragged heavy equipment onto rooftop positions to obtain the best vantage points for their filming and dismantled it after the filming. They negotiated inadvertent human obstacles. Much of this historic film has been made and preserved by members of the Halifax Cine Club. Founded in 1937, the club brought together local amateur film enthusiasts of whom some had been engaged in cine photography since the 1920s. They continued to produce newsreel compilations for group viewing until the late 1980s, when individual use of the camcorder was beginning to supersede the cine camera and interest in collaborative filmmaking was beginning to wane. Supplemented by other surviving film from private archive collections, this remarkable footage provides us with a vivid perspective on the development of the town for most of the 20th century and enables us to take a journey through time across the century which witnessed some of the most momentous changes in Halifax's long and fascinating history. Major A. H. Richardson, Chief Constable of the Borough of Halifax, was responsible for ensuring that the first royal visit to Halifax since the First World War of Her Royal Highness the Princess Mary, the only daughter of King George V and Queen Mary, on the 12th of March 1925, passed off without incident. He was also responsible for the direction of the filming, which gives prominence to the role of the police force in maintaining public order during the day. Marching five abreast, his officers paraded before the mayor, Alderman J. H. Waddington, before taking up their positions lining the route of the royal visit. The captions proclaimed that the whole town turned out to cheer the 27-year-old princess and her husband as the royal car, which had brought them from their home at Goldsboro Hall near Nesborough, turned into Crossley Street. The 1920s was a turbulent decade, characterized by economic depression and social unrest. Haunted by the spectre of Bolshevism and class war, which had toppled his cousin, Tsar Nicholas II's Romanov dynasty in Russia,
King George V encouraged a younger generation of royal ambassadors to engage with the people. The only daughter of King George V and Queen Mary, the princess had married Viscount Lascelles, a wealthy Yorkshire landowner, 15 years her senior, and became the only royal bride to make her permanent home in the north of England in the 20th century. Among the local dignitaries presented to the princess at a private reception inside the town hall were Sir George and Lady Hattie Fisher-Smith, who as Liberal Mayor and Mayoress of Halifax had welcomed the princess's parents to the town in 1896, and Mr James Parker, Halifax's first Labour MP, elected in 1906. After a private luncheon at Wellhead, the princess proceeded to the Royal Halifax Infirmary, which had been opened by her parents as Duke and Duchess of York in 1896, while her husband visited the Halifax branch of the British Legion. The princess had served at the Hospital for Sick Children in Great Ormond Street, passing the advanced nursing course with honours and became closely associated with the voluntary hospital movement. At the Royal Halifax Infirmary, accompanied by the hospital president, Mr. F. Lee, and the matron, Miss Jessie Hills, she opened a new maternity ward and met nurses and children on the Anne Holt Open Air Ward. After leaving the hospital, the princess, who was also a keen supporter of the Girl Guide movement, inspected some 500 local guides and brownies with the district commissioner, Lady Fisher-Smith. She then rejoined her husband at the headquarters of the British Legion, and the royal couple were driven through cheering crowds in Cornmarket before leaving the town. In 1926, another film commissioned by Halifax Borough Council and produced and directed by Major Richardson recorded another popular royal visit by Princess Mary's brother, His Royal Highness Edward Prince of Wales. An equally formidable contingent of police with motorcyclists as well as mounted police marched past the Mayor and Mayoress of Halifax, Alderman and Mrs William Smith. They were supplemented by large numbers of Boy Scouts with their staves, shorts and Baden-Powell hats, occupying positions along the route from the station to the town hall. Arriving by royal train, the prince, viewed by contemporaries in the 1920s as an easy-going, charming royal ambassador with a genuine sympathy for the unemployed and the depressed regions of Britain, was cheered by enthusiastic crowds as he left the station. Many Halifax people had travelled by special tram cars to Queensbury in 1923 when he'd paid the first royal visit to the neighbouring Pennine town and where he'd pledged to visit Halifax. His visit, planned originally for May 1926, had been postponed until Friday the 15th of October on account of the general strike, which Halifax members of the National Union of Railwaymen had backed with unparalleled enthusiasm. Expecting a guard of honour from the 4th West Riding Regiment, he attended a private reception inside the town hall, where he was introduced to a host of civic dignitaries, including the Right Honourable J. H. Whitley, one of Halifax's two MPs who'd served as Speaker of the House of Commons since 1921. He then resumed his progress through the town in an open-topped car to Shaw Royd in Clare Road to visit the local headquarters of the Talk Age movement. 
founded in 1920 by the Reverend Tubby Clayton, an Anglican padre in the First World War, and incorporated in 1922 by Royal Charter, the movement provided Christian fellowship and affordable accommodation for young men, particularly ex-servicemen. The Prince also visited the British Legion, Dean Clough and Ladyship Mills, but the principal purpose of his visit was to perform the official opening of Shibden Park. Shibden Park had formed part of the estate of local antiquarian John Lister, the last resident at Shibden Hall until its acquisition by Halifax Corporation. He had already painstakingly removed a timber-framed Tudor house threatened with demolition from the centre of the town and reconstructed it in the grounds to preserve the historic building for future generations. The Prince performed the official opening ceremony at the park gates. He then planted a commemorative oak tree in the grounds of the park, assisted by the mayor, who described him after the visit as a jolly young fellow with no swank. Unfortunately, vandals maliciously damaged the sapling within a week of the royal visit. The park had been bought for the people of Halifax through the generosity of Mr. A.S. McRae of Worley House, a local industrialist and benefactor. The boating lake and children's playground proved a great asset to the town. In Halifax, the part-time system of schooling had only been finally phased out in the 1920s, and many families continued to suffer social deprivation throughout the interwar years. However, these children clearly knew how to enjoy themselves, and even the dog took his turn on the slide. For many Halifax children, a visit to Shibden Park was their only experience of a holiday outing in the interwar years. For a group of local Masonic businessmen and their wives, however, motoring outings to the Yorkshire Dales brought some relief from the anxieties of economic recession. Henry Woodward, chemist, photographic supplier and early cine enthusiast, recorded the highlights of some of these excursions in 1929. The cine camera was clearly still a novelty. Many people remained camera conscious and shy or self-consciously exhibitionist, determined not to treat the camera too seriously. Moreover, editing and titling were still very unsophisticated, with captions inserted in a plain long-hand script. Back in the sky above Yeadon Aerodrome signalled the arrival of another royal visitor to Halifax on the 13th of July 1931. His Royal Highness Prince George, later Duke of Kent, the younger brother of the Prince of Wales and Princess Mary, landed on the mown grass in a flimsy looking biplane which he'd co-piloted from London. The Prince's flying visit was officially designated as a visit to Halifax Industries during a period of continuing difficulty for local industry following the Wall Street crash. The filming on this occasion not only showed footage of the Prince's spectacular arrival in Yorkshire, but also included, for the first time, extensive interior shots of local industrial plant. The Prince arrived in an open-topped car amidst smiling and waving crowds at the Milethorne works of the Butler Machine Tool Works, accompanied by the Mayor of Halifax, Alderman John Carter. 
James Butler, the founder of the firm, had acquired the Milethorn site in 1917. But developments had been severely restricted by the slump of the 1920s when orders had dwindled and machines stockpiled. However, in 1931, Butler secured a major order from Stalinist Russia and the firm's export trade began to recover. The Prince's motorcade then drove through the center of the town via Ward's End The Prince's next scheduled visit was to the Clark Bridge Mills of Messrs Peyton and Baldwin which specialized in the production of high-quality woolen yarn. The 29-year-old bachelor, generally regarded as the most handsome of the royal princes, received a particularly enthusiastic welcome from mill girls at the end of his visit. A series of panoramic views of the town from Beacon Hill provided a vivid impression of the heavily industrial townscape surrounding the town's rime-encrusted medieval parish church by 1931. By 1932, Henry Woodward, the Halifax chemist, was no longer content with brief forays into the Yorkshire Dales, but was now venturing further afield. He took his family on an extended cruise on the SS Alondra from the port of Liverpool in 1932 to the Canaries, on which he took the opportunity to develop his skills with the cine camera. The film included informal shots of members of the family and friends playing games, drinking tea and eating ice creams. It also recorded a range of sightseeing experiences from the various parts of court. These included views of the Graf Zeppelin airship, sighted at Las Palmas. During the First World War, German Zeppelins had inflicted serious damage in over 50 raids on British targets, killing and wounding over 2,000 people. Others continued to favor less exotic destinations, such as J.W. Greenwood and Friends, who took a rail trip to Cleveland in 1935 and enjoyed a dip in the Lido at the Lancashire Seaside Resort. Meanwhile, 
Other local children took advantage of a few days away from the smoke-filled urban valleys by visiting a farm in the open Norland countryside, which served as a children's holiday home until its replacement by new purpose-built premises in 1937. Mid-30s shots of Halifax reveal the unhealthy, smoke-filled environment in which many people lived. the most ambitious film to be made in the 1930s was the filming of the coronation year visit of their majesties King George VI and Queen Elizabeth, which was part of a four-day tour of northern industrial towns. They began their visit on the 20th of October 1937 in the relative seclusion of Shibden Hall, where they lunched with Princess Mary, now the Princess Royal, and her husband who'd succeeded his father as Earl of Harewood in 1929, Sir Samuel Hoare, the Home Secretary, and local civic dignitaries. This was the only occasion in the town's history where Halifax Corporation played host to no fewer than four senior members of the royal family simultaneously in a remote half-timbered farmstead. After the dramatic events of 1936, which had seen the abdication of King Edward VIII and the accession of his brother, King George VI, the visit of the new king and queen, neither of whom had visited Halifax previously, was eagerly anticipated. Consequently, a team of five cameramen, under the direction of a local professional photographer, Hugh Greaves, whose family had been taking photographs of the town since the mid-Victorian era, was entrusted with the production of the film record. It was the most ambitious film of a royal visit so far attempted, with cameras in a variety of positions along the route. After lunch and a relaxing stroll in the gardens of Shibden Hall, the royal party drove through cheering crowds to Halifax Town Hall. where the king inspected a guard of honour and various presentations were made to their majesties for the first time in public under a specially erected canopy. They included the Australian rugby league team, immaculate in blazers and flannels, with one of their injured players hobbling onto the dais on crutches. After leaving the platform, the players entertained the royal guests with their famous bonding ritual and war cry. The royal party then drove to Savile Park to receive a rousing farewell from hordes of local schoolchildren and from onlookers on Huddersfield Road, the crowds pressing close to the royal cars following the tram lines. Some local industrialists had expressed a reluctance to close their factories for the whole day, preferring to release their employees for an extended lunch break. But this doesn't appear to have diminished significantly the size or enthusiasm of the crowds.
Another contemporary film revealed the changing face of Halifax in the late 1930s when extensive slum clearance was undertaken by Halifax Corporation. New housing legislation during the interwar years enabled cramped and inferior inner urban housing to be replaced with new council housing estates on greenfield sites around the western and northern perimeters of the town at Pelham, Ovenden, Mixenden and Boothtown. Crossfields, one of the most squalid areas of the town, had been the first slum housing clearance in 1926. A decade later, condemned property around Pelham Lane and Gibbet Street, including Hoyland's Passage and Dungeon Street, and around Charlestown at Lower Court and Sun Street was demolished, and the residents rehoused in more spacious council housing. By 1939, some 2,708 new council dwellings had been constructed. The majority with two or three bedrooms and all with baths, electric lighting and gas heating. Meanwhile, older property in the centre of the town was cleared to facilitate road widening and the provision of new municipal car parks for the increasing volume of motor vehicles appearing on the streets of Halifax during the interwar years. The streets were cleared of traffic, however, for the annual Royal Halifax Infirmary Gala, which was the main fundraising event for the local voluntary hospital. The vivid spectacle with its procession of marching bands, decorated floats, including the Gala Queen and her retinue and brewery drays, always attracted huge public interest and support. During the 1930s, a succession of extensions were opened at the hospital, but little or no building work was undertaken during the Second World War, when the hospital experienced difficulty in obtaining materials and equipment.
The first Halifax Corporation tram had operated between Halifax and High Road Well in June 1898, and the tram era had reached its peak in Halifax in 1929, when 106 trams had operated along some 58 miles of track. During the 1930s, however, increasing competition from the more versatile and economically efficient motor bus resulted in a steady contraction of the tram service. On the 14th of February 1939, local cine enthusiasts were present to record the final journey of Halifax's last tram, bringing to a close a 41-year era of transport history, during which some 820 million passengers had travelled 75 million miles on one of the hilliest systems in the country. Eight trams lined up at Mason Green, Ovenden to complete their final historic journey along Keithley Road to Halifax. It was a dark, cold night, posing a challenge to local cine enthusiasts who'd usually filmed public events in daylight, but thousands turned out to witness the spectacle. The driver of the last tram, number 109, was accompanied by the oldest tram conductor in the country and members of the Passenger Transport Committee, who sang on Il Clamore Bartat and Old Lang Syne as the tram made its slow journey. On the 16th of August, the last Halifax trams, numbers 111 and 113, were burned at the Halifax Tram Depot. Gordon Gledhill, a member of the third generation of a highly successful precision engineering firm, filmed the last Great Yorkshire show to be held in Halifax in July 1939 on Savile Park. Unfortunately, an epidemic of foot and mouth disease had resulted in the imposition of a Ministry of Agriculture ban on all cattle movement in Halifax on the 8th of June. Consequently, on the 27th of June, it was decided to abandon classes for cattle, sheep, pigs and goats but to go ahead with the other events planned in the programme. Spectators had therefore to be content with viewing the horses, farming machinery and horticultural displays. The foot and mouth crisis had a severe impact on attendance figures, which at 37,043 for the three-day event were the lowest recorded since 1927 and fewer than half the numbers which had attended the show when it had last been held in Halifax in 1928. Gordon Gledhill ensured that his own family's stand, displaying their famous time recorders and cash registers, was recorded for posterity on the celluloid. On the 8th of May 1939, a rapturous welcome was given to Halifax Rugby League players after their Wembley triumph, in which they secured the Rugby League Challenge Cup after a resounding defeat of Salford by 20 points to 3 against all predictions. Led by the Lee Mount Brass Band, the victorious team's open-topped bus made a triumphant progress to a town hall reception through crowds of supporters. However, within a few months, local sporting fixtures were disrupted by the outbreak of the Second World War. By the time of the Second World War of 1939 to 45, cine photography was sufficiently developed for a fairly extensive local record to be compiled of the impact of the war on the home front in Halifax. Locally made films such as The Billet reflected the national mood of defiance and helped to raise public morale in the aftermath of Dunkirk, where some 330,000 British and Allied troops had been evacuated from the northeastern French port and its neighbouring beaches after they'd been trapped when the German armies broke through the Ardennes and advanced towards the English Channel. On Friday the 31st of May and Saturday the 1st of June 1940, the first survivors from the evacuated British Expeditionary Force began to arrive in Halifax, destined for accommodation at local mills and private houses such as the Gleddings, 
a fine stone-built mansion on Birdcage Lane, the former home of the late Sir George and Lady Fisher Smith. A field kitchen was set up on Savile Park Moor, and the soldiers received a warm reception from the people of Halifax, receiving gifts of food, refreshments, cigarettes, and even gramophones and wireless sets. For four years between 1940 and 1944, the Halifax Home Guard was charged with the responsibility of defending the country from a possible invasion by the formidable German forces. When the Home Guard finally stood down on the 3rd of December 1944, the Halifax Cine Club was commissioned by the Halifax Corporation to record the final parades. The 23rd Battalion marched past the headquarters of the Halifax Building Society, with its wall of sandbags still protecting the building, to the Regal Cinema, where the Mayor of Halifax, Alderman Lewis Chambers, and Colonel R. M. Shaw paid tribute to the years of self-sacrifice, self-denial, and self-discipline. Meanwhile, the 24th Battalion and the 102nd Rocket Anti-Aircraft Battery attended a similar event in the pouring rain at the Picture House Ward's End. then took part in a final parade at Bull Green. Cine Club was also commissioned by Halifax Corporation to film the farewell parade of the local civil defence services in 1945. Men and women turned out for the final parade, which attracted large crowds of spectators. The parade formed up for a final ceremony at the Shea Football Stadium. Addressed by the Mayor of Halifax, Alderman Lewis Chambers, resplendent in his trademark top hat.
Mr. J.E. Martin, ARP officer, handed back the civil defense flag to the mayor for safe custody. It was not to be required again in the 20th century. The ceremony included the singing of Land of Hope and Glory and concluded with a final march past. The relaxed and smiling faces of Halifax people at Manor Heath in 1945 reveal the widespread sense of relief at the ending of hostilities. was in holiday mood, with houses and streets bedecked with Union flags and brightly coloured bunting. And military bands providing musical entertainment for the crowds. Bonfires were also lit, on which effigies of Hitler were burned. Thousands also turned out on the streets to witness a Thanksgiving Sunday victory procession to Halifax Parish Church. On VE Day, crowds had gathered in Bull Green and Southgate, where a cine enthusiast filmed scenes from the upstairs window of Taylor's Chemists. There was spontaneous dancing in the streets. Some revelers greeted the film cameraman with waves. And there was even a kiss recorded on camera for posterity.
On the 18th of June 1945, Waterloo Day, a public holiday, the Halifax Cine Club was invited to film the Duke of Wellington's regiment being given the freedom of Halifax, which gave the regiment the privilege of marching through the town on all ceremonial occasions with bands playing, colours flying and bayonets fixed. At noon, 500 members of the regiment, which had been formed in 1881 by the amalgamation of two other historic regiments, were drawn up in Bull Green in the presence of some 25,000 spectators. They watched the Mayor of Halifax present a deed granting the freedom of the borough to Colonel Pickering, the Colonel of the regiment. The parade then marched to Halifax Parish Church, where the deed of grant was handed over to the custody of the vicar of Halifax, and where a regimental chapel was later established. The celebrations extended throughout the day, with entertainment for young and old. The visit of Britain's redoubtable wartime Prime Minister Winston Churchill to Halifax on the 27th of June 1945 as part of his pre-election tour of the Industrial North was filmed by Harold Werritt, 1900 to 1968, a Halifax cabinet maker and amateur cine enthusiast. A crowd of 20,000 packed into Silver Street, Cow Green and Bull Green to witness his arrival and hear his 20-minute speech in support of the sitting Conservative MP for Halifax, Gilbert Gledhill. However, Labour won the election with a landslide and Councillor Dryden Brook was returned as Labour MP for Halifax. A typical Halifax family, the Coldwell family of Woodside Place, was selected to provide the focus for a documentary film, We of the West Riding, scripted by local author Phyllis Bentley and directed for the British Council by Ken Anakin, a Beverly civil servant who later went on to achieve international recognition as a filmmaker. Albert Coldwell, a motor driver and keen pigeon fancier, was portrayed in the film as a textile worker, while his wife, a mother of nine, was featured performing a range of demanding domestic duties. The film emphasized the industrial strengths of the West Riding and the popularity of escaping to the hills and moors in weekend cycling expeditions. Another local passion filmed by amateur cine enthusiasts after the war was amateur dramatics. The Halifax Amateur Operatic Society, founded in 1901, resumed its productions in 1946 at the Grand Theatre with Silver Wings, later moving to the Palace Theatre. A major landmark in the life of the local community in 1948, recorded on film, was the centenary of the granting of Halifax's municipal charter. 
On a cloudy day, the official celebrations began on Sunday the 21st of March with a colourful procession of no fewer than 17 civic heads from across the county accompanied by their town clerks and mace bearers who joined Alderman Charles Holdsworth, JP, Mayor of Halifax, for the historic occasion. Many different groups were represented, ranging from war veterans to youth organisations. A boys brigade band led the procession, followed by the Halifax Parish Church Choir and the guest preacher, the Lord Archbishop of York, the Right Reverend Dr. Cyril Foster Garbett, who urged the members of the congregation to take an active personal interest in the public life of the community to which they belonged. In the following year, Halifax Rugby League Club made history when they reached Wembley from the lowest league position ever recorded by a finalist and also became the first team not to score in a Wembley final and never even had a shot at goal. They consequently suffered a resounding defeat, losing to the neighbouring club Bradford Northern, who were appearing at Wembley for the third year in succession. However, there was still a great reception waiting for them on their return to Halifax, filmed for posterity by Harold Werrett. A rooftop cameraman captured on film the first visit to Halifax on the 26th of July 1949 of Her Royal Highness the Princess Elizabeth, accompanied by His Royal Highness the Duke of Edinburgh, whom she'd married nearly two years earlier. After visiting an exhibition of local industrial products at the barracks in Arden Road and touring the town in a procession, the royal couple visited the town hall and signed the visitor's book in the presence of over 200 invited guests in the Victoria Hall. As they left Halifax, the couple took gifts of a woolen baby garment for their eight-month-old son, Prince Charles, plus a box of confectionery. More distant views of the town from South Aram Bank in the late 1940s often revealed a pall of smoke hanging over the heavily industrialized townscape. In other contemporary views, the Halifax Parish Church, the Town Hall, the Railway, the Halifax Branch Canal, Square Congregational Church and Chapel, the Peace Hall, and the Dean Clough Mills of Crossley Carpets are clearly visible. It was only with the impact of clean air legislation after 1950 that the Halifax townscape began to take on a distinctly less murky appearance, enhanced by stone cleaning programs designed to remove the encrusted grime of 150 years or more.
1950, the Halifax Cine Club produced a promotional film for the town entitled It Started With Wool, celebrating the town's importance as a major manufacturing centre. Surveying the mid-20th century townscape, the case was proudly advanced that the Halifax of today was the outcome of generations of workers in wool. From the late 15th century, as a result of the growth of the woolen industry in the town and its hinterland, Halifax had expanded westwards from the medieval parish church, developing into a major manufacturing centre by the early 19th century, when the application of steam technology had spawned a profusion of mill chimneys, factories and warehouses, many of which were still very much in evidence in panoramic views of the town in 1950. Indeed, the industrial landscape was relieved only by the parks and open spaces endowed by mill-owning philanthropists, such as the Crossleys, whose magnificent mid-Victorian People's Park still boasted a pair of swans with a family of cygnets in 1950. Besides emphasizing the importance of wool to the local economy, the film also celebrated the town's vibrant economic diversity by the mid-20th century. For, by 1950, Halifax not only boasted the largest carpet manufacturing firm in the world, had John Crossley and Sons, Dean Clough, it also housed the headquarters of the largest building society in the world, in Commercial Street. Moreover, its importance in the confectionery industry had earned the town the sobriquet of Toffee Town, with Macintosh's Quality Street assortment a well-established market leader. Furthermore, new modernist functionalist extensions to the town's technical college overlooking the town's Victorian People's Park were under construction when the film was being made, underlining local determination to maintain the town's considerable reputation as a leading manufacturing centre. However, the survival of the Halifax and District Agricultural Society's annual show throughout the 20th century testified to the continuing importance of horticulture and farming in the local economy. The wide range of exhibits included flowers and vegetables, goats, shire horses, cattle and dogs of every variety of breed. Inevitably, two local pigeon fanciers were well represented at the show. Unfortunately, however, for the second year in succession, the Halifax Agricultural Show on Saturday the 9th of August 1952 at Shibden Park was ruined by heavy rain, with many obliged to shelter under newspapers. But the inclement weather did not spoil one small girl's enjoyment of her candy floss nor deter the intrepid show jumpers from putting their horses through their paces. Saturday morning out provided footage of young and old descending on the town for a Saturday morning shopping expedition in the early 1950s.
cameramen filmed from several vantage points around the centre of the town, including one of the newly installed traffic islands designed to provide refuge for pedestrians in an increasingly traffic-dominated era. At busy periods, policemen were usually on hand to halt the traffic and allow shoppers to use strategically placed pedestrian crossings. In the decade before the clean air legislation of 1959 began to transform the situation, the atmosphere was distinctly murky in some of these distant townscape views. However, relatively few local people were car owners during this period and largely dependent on public transport. Consequently, long queues for buses can be seen outside the headquarters of the Halifax Building Society in Commercial Street. Cameramen also filmed contrasting scenes of tranquility, where it was possible to escape from the hustle and bustle of the town centre at People's Park, Bellevue, Savile Park, and in the surrounding countryside, where the tranquility might only be disturbed by the occasional steam train crossing the viaduct at Copley. The Roman Catholic Churches of Halifax put on a display of loyalty for the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II at the Shea Stadium on the 17th of May 1953. In 1952-53, Halifax elected its first Roman Catholic mayor, Alderman William Regan, who had a lifelong association with St. Bernard's Roman Catholic Church. The town remained in festive mood throughout the summer of Coronation Year, and although heavy rain dampened the celebrations on Coronation Day itself, cine enthusiasts recorded footage of the street decorations and floral displays which added colour to the town throughout the summer months. A huge portrait of the young Queen, who had made her first visit to Halifax in July 1949, was displayed outside Halifax Town Hall, and the streets festooned with banners and shields. The Halifax Cine Club filmed the colourful floral displays around the town to commemorate the royal event at Bull Green, People's Park, Crowwood Park, the Halifax General Hospital, Bankfield and Ward's End. The Halifax Courier advertised a five-day visit of Billy Smart Circus from the 22nd to the 27th of June, providing summer entertainment for Coronation Year at Manor Heath.
cine cameras captured the procession of a troop of Indian elephants up Horton Street from the railway station, watched by huge crowds and followed by an excited throng of small boys. Although the heyday of the churches and chapels was already coming to a close with the dawn of the 20th century, many people's lives continued to revolve around the church and chapel throughout the century. As town centre churches like St James's closed in April 1953, new churches were built to serve new housing estates at Mixenden, and local cine enthusiasts filmed the procession from St Mary's Illingworth for the stone-laying ceremony for the new church on the 1st of July 1953. The new church was dedicated to the Holy Nativity on the 3rd of December 1955. The 11th Duke of Devonshire, greeted here by the Mayor and Mayoress of Halifax, Alderman and Mrs William Regan, was invited to perform the official opening ceremony for the new West Riding Folk Museum at Shibden Hall on the 4th of July 1953. After the opening, the official guests, including the burly, frock-coated and gated figure of Eric Treacy, Archdeacon of Halifax, seen here entering the vast 17th century barn, toured the museum. Frank Atkinson, the innovative Halifax Museum's director, saw the potential of utilising the outbuildings at Shibden Hall to create a West Yorkshire open-air museum based on Scandinavian models and the recently opened new Welsh Folk Museum at Cardiff. The single-storey buildings grouped around the farmyard were converted into craft workshops, a public house and estate cottage. For the official opening, traditional craftsmen demonstrated their rapidly disappearing skills, providing a rare filming opportunity for local cine enthusiasts. They included the hand file cutter, a precursor of the modern machine tool industry. The blacksmith and the wheelwright, both familiar figures on the local scene in a long vanished age when transport was dependent on the horse. The clogger, who once provided the staple footwear for an army of mill workers clattering across the cobbled streets. The Duke displayed a considerable interest in the historic hall and its grounds, and offered the museum an historic barn from his Yorkshire estates. Holidays, interrupted by the war, resumed in the post-war years, and film footage has survived of Halifax people embarking on Saturday the 11th of July 1953 from the streets around Harrison Road in fleets of coaches for such seaside destinations as Rill, Southport, Scarborough, Blackpool, Flandidno, Cleethorpes, Great Yarmouth and Morecambe. The growing prosperity after a recession in the textile trade in 1952 the end of austerity and rationing by the mid-fifties and the opportunity to escape from the smoky urban atmosphere for a week of exposure to the benefits of sea air proved an increasingly irresistible attraction to many. Indeed, by 1954, some 20,000 people, more than one-fifth of the town's population, left Halifax for holiday destinations during Wakes Week, the second week in July. Bulging suitcases left little room for some of the elaborate hats sported by Halifax ladies in holiday mood, while many of the men were more modestly attired in flat caps or trilbies. Relatively few families owned cars, and those that did not travel by coach, travelled by train. The scene at Halifax Town Station was equally hectic, with police officers controlling the queues of rail passengers and crowded platforms for every train departure. Although the second half of the 20th century was free from the devastating international conflicts which had cast a shadow on the lives of the people of Halifax in the first half of the 20th century, Cold War tension between the Soviet-dominated communist bloc and the West from the mid-1940s to the late 1980s generated continuing fears about a possible nuclear attack, particularly in the immediate post-war years. On the 12th of July 1953, large-scale civil defence exercises held in Halifax in conjunction with other West Riding centres were captured on a newsreel film alarmingly entitled Atom Bomb on Halifax. 
filmed in the pouring rain, the exercise inevitably failed to simulate with any degree of realism the likely impact of nuclear attack, as intrepid civil defense volunteers, protected only by tin hats, were filmed rescuing casualties from the upper stories of amazingly resilient buildings. Four months later, in November 1953, the cameras captured star of stage and screen, Halifax-born Eric Portman, opening the impressive new John Mollett Limited store on Silver Street, Halifax. With showrooms in Bradford, Huddersfield, Leeds and Keithley, John Mollett Limited, specialists in craftsmanship built fireplaces, maintained that their quality fireplaces, in an era when the coal fire remained the central interior feature of most houses, were unequalled in the north of England. Large crowds were again in evidence in the spring of the following year when a mass exodus of Halifax supporters left the town to watch the Rugby League Challenge Cup final replay at the Oddsall Stadium on the 15th of May 1954. Roadside traders enjoyed a brisk trade in hot hamburgers, pies and coffee. Having tied the Challenge Cup final with Warrington at Wembley, Halifax lost 8-4 to Warrington at Oddsall Stadium at Bradford before a crowd estimated in excess of 120,000. Indeed, many left because they couldn't see the game. Halifax Town Association Football Club was filmed training for the new soccer season in 1954. Cameras also filmed crowds of supporters arriving at the Shea for a League Division 3 fixture with Gateshead on Wednesday the 18th of August and football action from the match against Wrexham on Saturday the 22nd of August. The granting of the freedom of Halifax to Lord Mackintosh, later the first Viscount Mackintosh, son of the founder of the Halifax toffee firm and inventor of the celebrated Quality Street brand, who'd also spearheaded the government's national savings campaign and become a leading figure in the promotion of Sunday schools, provided an opportunity to celebrate the achievement of one of the town's most celebrated sons, and cameras were on hand to record the historic occasion. Lord Mackintosh regarded the ceremony at the Alexandra Hall on the 29th of June 1954 as his finest hour. In his speech accepting the honour, Lord Mackintosh declared that he was a great believer in local patriotism and that the great thing was to know where you belong and not to strive all the time to be something you're not cut out for, but to do what comes naturally with all your heart, giving yourself to the daily task and letting the morrow take care of itself. During the 50s, cine cameras also recorded developments affecting several key locations around the town. Crossfields, cleared of substandard housing in the town's first slum clearance program of the interwar years, now became a site for Halifax's first bus station, which was filmed under construction and after completion in August 1954. The mayor of Halifax performed the official opening ceremony on the 16th of May 1955. Following a wave of immigration to Halifax from Eastern Europe from the 1930s, new religious communities were established in the town. The former King Peter II of Yugoslavia, who had been exiled to London when the Germans invaded Yugoslavia in 1941 and deposed when Yugoslavia became a communist dictatorship in 1945, visited Halifax on the 21st of August and the 26th of September 1954 opening the Serbian Orthodox Church of the Holy Trinity in the former Mount Carmel Primitive Methodist Church Booth Town on his second visit. Serbian exiles throughout the north of England flocked to Halifax to give a tumultuous welcome to the ex-king. Among those present at the service of consecration were the mayor and mayoress of Halifax, Alderman and Mrs. Barber, Bull Green and its surrounding streets were brought virtually to a standstill in 1955 as a result of a major fire at a tyre warehouse at the bottom of Lister Lane. Although fire appliances from the nearby Halifax fire station on Gibbet Street were soon at the scene, the burning rubber proved difficult to extinguish. The fire, in which there were no casualties, proved a popular spectacle for onlookers, including many children.
Children and young people were often filmed in the uniformed organizations, such as the Boy Scouts at the annual St. George's Day Parade in April 1955 to the Halifax Parish Church, which would be filled for the occasion. The parade also included a march past with the mayor, Councillor Harold Pickles, taking the salute. On the 1st of May 1959, cameras filmed the last passing out parade at Wellesley Barracks, the depot of the Duke of Wellington's regiment for 83 years. The Duke of Wellington's regiment and its predecessor regiments had historic links with the town extending back over 250 years. And after the Second World War, the regiment had been granted the freedom of the county borough of Halifax on Waterloo Day, the 18th of June 1945. Although military reorganization resulted in the closure of the barracks in 1959, a small regimental headquarters was retained at High Road Well. Moreover, a regimental museum was established at Bankfield Museum and a regimental chapel at Halifax Parish Church. The curtain also fell for the last time at the Palace Theatre on the 30th of May 1959 after the final performance by the Halifax Amateur Operatic Society and the Halifax Light Opera Society of Rodgers and Hammerstein's popular musical The King and I. In July, the Italian demolition contractor, Francis Fascioni, who'd recently demolished the Grand Theatre at North Bridge, was called in to demolish the palace, and soon only the proscenium arch and cinema screen were recognisable in the crumbling shell of the building. The site was acquired for development by O and C Estates Limited of Halifax for £55,000 and is now home to a fish and chip restaurant. The Halifax Agricultural Show, however, continued to thrive, attracting some 20,000 visitors to Shibden Park on the 8th of August 1959, equaling the previous 1955 attendance record. Local charity galas, such as that organized by the Forest Cottage Community Centre, a centre opened at Ovenden in 1950 to provide a community base for new housing estates on the outskirts of Halifax, also continued to prove popular attractions. The colourful floats revealed the continuing role of the Wheatley Methodist Sunday School in the life of the local community, and the willingness of local industries such as Macintoshes to provide sponsorship. The 60s film archive for Halifax opens with a nostalgic look at the emergence of the most popular youth movement in the town during the 20th century, with film of the Girl Guides 50th birthday party at Ovenden Park, the Halifax Rugby Union ground. A series of tableaux featuring girls somewhat unconvincingly attired as males depicted the development of the movement from the Boy Scout Association and the later emergence of the Brownie section catering for a younger age group. Cameramen also continued to film crowds enjoying themselves at charitable events. In 1960, they recorded on film a garden party at the White Windows Cheshire Home at Sowerby, which had become the first Cheshire home for the disabled in the West Riding of Yorkshire, when it accepted its first patient in November 1956. Unusual weather patterns continued to attract the attention of filmmakers and during the severe winter of 1963, ice skaters were filmed skating on the frozen football pitch at the Shea Football Stadium on the 2nd of March.
With more money in their pockets in the 1960s and influenced by the twin pressures of consumerism and the mass media, many teenagers and young people of both sexes were becoming more fashion conscious and hairstyles increasingly reflected those of current pop idols and rock stars such as Elvis Presley and the young Cliff Richard. Film of the National Hairdressing Competition at the Alexandra Hall in Halifax in 1963 reveals the penchant for elaborate, bouffant, heavily lacquered hairstyles favoured by teenage girls in the early 1960s and the flashy, back-combed, brill cream styles favoured by teenage boys before the Beatle mop cuts became all the rage later in the decade. Alongside the uniformed youth organizations strongly represented in the annual Halifax Charity Gala and traditional childhood themes such as Alice in Wonderland, film of a Halifax Charity Gala procession in the mid-1960s provided the first evidence of the impact of the new pop culture of the swinging 60s. A Norland float, inspired by the popular Lennon McCartney Beatles hit of 1965, We All Live in a Yellow Submarine, featured the Ladstone Rock Submarine and its motley crew film of another Halifax charity gala procession of the 1960s reflected the development of a growing international youth culture with a float featuring youth of the nations. Among the crowds in Manor Heath Park on this occasion was a group of African visitors. Attractions in the park included trampolines for the energetic, a barbecue for the hungry, and a punch and judy show for the young. Inspired by a popular television speeded up version of a trip on the London Brighton railway line, Halifax cine enthusiasts filmed a whistle-stop road tour of Halifax in the 1960s entitled Steady As You Go. Approaching King Cross from the Burnley Road, the high-speed circuit of the town proceeded via Skirkote Moor Road, Huddersfield Road, Ward's End, Bull Green, Broad Street and other town centre streets to Heath Park and Free School Lane, ending at the Royal Halifax Infirmary though not through the magic of film technology in the hospital's casualty department.
Besides being a decade of cultural and social change, the 1960s saw the completion of a technological revolution in local industry, as electric motive power finally ousted the steam engine from local textile factories, and local steam enthusiasts made a determined effort to capture for posterity the passing of the age of steam. Eli Halliwell was filmed firing one of the last steam boilers in use in Halifax at Joseph Horsfall and Sons Limited, Clarence Mill, Pelham Lane, Halifax. In the 1950s there had been some 51 spinning firms in the Halifax district. By the end of the 20th century, Joseph Horsfall and Sons Limited was the sole surviving worsted spinning mill in the town. Filmed between January 1969 and February 1971 by six Halifax Cine Club camera teams, the 16mm sound colour film This Town of Ours was a response to a request from Councillor Harry Ludlam for a promotional film to send to Halifax, Nova Scotia, which he'd visited in his mayoral year, and Aachen, Halifax's twin town in Germany. The film, the most ambitious yet attempted by the Halifax Cine Club, included for the first time aerial photography, which revealed the considerable reduction in atmospheric pollution achieved as a result of the impact of clean air legislation during the previous decade. Mr. Eric Boothroyd, the Speedway promoter, made a Beagle Pup light aircraft available for the aerial photography, but the limited cockpit space presented considerable technical problems, which were only resolved by the cameraman turning his camera upside down and shooting with the motor running in reverse. The film was a celebration of Halifax's economic vitality and manufacturing diversity. It boasted that stone from local quarries was being used in the construction of a new bridge across the River Thames. It trumpeted the global success of the town's thriving carpet industry, which had made the Crossleys of Dean Clough a household name. It provided a roll call of the celebrated names in engineering and machine tools, which had made Halifax one of the most important centres of precision engineering outside the East Midlands in the 20th century. It illustrated graphically how the expanding local confectionery industry had earned Halifax the sobriquet Toffee Town. It demonstrated how Percy Shaw's brilliant cat's eye reflecting road stud had contributed to safer motoring around the world. It also unwittingly revealed how the historic symbol of Halifax's textile vibrancy in the past, the Halifax Peace Hall, in use as a wholesale fruit and vegetable market since 1871, had suffered obscurity and neglect. Its rediscovery as the jewel in the crown of Halifax's Georgian architectural heritage and a unique community space still lay in the future. Some streets at ground level also appeared shrouded in a haze of blue smoke. Others displayed washing suspended across the street. Meanwhile, aerial views revealed the density of terraced housing around the centre of the town. However, new housing estates had mushroomed on greenfield sites around the perimeter of the town. And high-rise flats were replacing some of the areas of inner urban decay. Moreover, some of the accumulated grime of a century or more was at last being removed from some town centre buildings, such as Halifax Town Hall. A plethora of new traffic signs indicated an increasing volume of local traffic.
This resulted in growing frustrations as motorists competed for the limited parking spaces. However, the construction of the area's first motorway link with the M62, opened by Queen Elizabeth II in 1971, brought obvious economic benefits to the town for both commuters, local residents and businesses. Moreover, an ambitious central area development plan to relieve growing traffic congestion in the town centre resulted in the construction of a spectacular flyover and inner relief road. A new multi-storey car park was also provided to help relieve the parking problem. Several new places of worship to replace buildings demolished on the route of the new inner ring road. A new fire station was also under construction on Skirkoke Moor Road, with better access to the developing urban road network than its predecessor in Gibbet Street. It was not only the physical shape of Halifax which was changing in the second half of the 20th century. Halifax's population was becoming more ethnically diverse. From the 1950s, immigrants from South Asia and especially from the Mirpur region of Pakistan began to arrive in the town to work in the local textile mills. Exotic oriental restaurants now existed alongside traditional fish and chips. Supermarkets were also beginning to compete with traditional markets and town centre shops. Cinema had not yet been completely ousted by discotheques and nightclubs, though by 1971 both the former Odeon and Gaumont cinemas had succumbed to bingo. Women were now more often to be seen in many, but not quite all, traditionally male-dominated pubs and clubs. Spectator sports also remained popular. Halifax Association Football Club still shared the Shea Stadium with Speedway rather than Rugby League, which continued to attract large crowds at Thrum Hall. However, there were also growing opportunities for active participation in leisure pursuits such as swimming at the new Halifax Swimming Pool on Huddersfield Road. This town of ours included footage of the headquarters of the Halifax Building Society in Commercial Street, which had remained the largest building society in the world since the merger of the Halifax Permanent Benefit Building Society and the Halifax Equitable Building Society in 1927. Shortly after the completion of the film, Stanley Hill, a member of the Halifax Cine Club, filmed the excavation of the site for the new headquarters of the Halifax Building Society, which had formerly housed Ramsden's Brewery. Into this muddy hole in the ground would be constructed secure storage for the largest number of mortgage deeds on any single site in the UK.
On the 13th of November 1974, Stanley Hill also filmed the crowds which welcomed Queen Elizabeth II on her visit to Halifax on a wild, wet and windy day to officially open the new headquarters of the Halifax Building Society. He also filmed the official opening ceremony of the new Burdock Way on the 6th of April 1973. Opening Burdock Way was the Mayor of Halifax, Maurice Jagger, the last Mayor of Halifax to complete a term of office before Halifax became part of the new Metropolitan Borough of Calderdale. Local cine enthusiasts turned out in force in March 1974 to record the spectacle of the demolition of the twin concrete cooling towers of Halifax Power Station, which had been erected between 1937 and 1939, but which were now redundant following the closure of the power station in 1970. However, the cine cameramen and the large crowd of spectators, which had gathered on the slopes of Beacon Hill, were to be disappointed. A loud bang resounded across the valley terrace. One of the 170-foot high towers lurched a little and sank 15 feet, but the twin towers, known affectionately as Salt and Pepper, remained standing at a crazy angle like a post-industrial leaning tower of Pisa. In the end, the towers were demolished piecemeal. Halifax Cine Club newsreel compilation for 1983 focused upon the long-awaited Woolshops development. The former Modell Fashion House, the most stylish ladies' fashion store in Halifax until its closure in 1979, is seen here boarded up. It would later re-emerge as a new W.H. Smith store. An artist's drawing revealed the scope of the development, and soon construction was in progress and the first shops were tenanted by October. A notable feature was the preservation of an historic half-timbered Jacobean building at the top of the cobbled medieval routeway, which offered magnificent vistas beyond Halifax Parish Church to Beacon Hill. Cameras also captured the May Day celebrations at Shibden Hall, which included a mummer's play performance, and at the Peace Hall, where the main attractions included donkey rides for the children, mock mountaineering, and combat between inflated Cumberland giants. In 1983, the Calderdale Navigation Society held a waterways fortnight, while the Boys Brigade celebrated its centenary. and the milk race finished in Calderdale. A year after the demise of carpet production at Dean Clough, the 1.25 million square feet mill complex was bought by Ernest Hall, a successful businessman and property developer, and his business partner Jonathan Silver, whose success had been achieved in the fashion industry. By 1989, there were around 2,500 working for 200 companies, including Halifax Building Society, and the former industrial complex had been reborn as Yorkshire's leading arts, educational and enterprise centre. The mayor and mayoress of Calderdale visited Dean Clough to view the exciting changes taking place, and John Noakes, the former Blue Peter presenter and native of Halifax, in characteristic daredevil fashion, abseiled into the mill yard overlooking the River Hebble. The year came to a festive close with traders recreating the atmosphere of a Victorian Christmas at the Halifax Borough Market by donning period costume and singing carols around the Christmas tree in the Southgate Pedestrian Precinct. Filming in 1984 included a number of well-supported sponsored sporting events, beginning with a Halifax Round Table Fun Run, which finished at the Halifax Peace Hall.
Then, semi-enthusiasts filmed a half-marathon event, including the participation of a group of determined, physically handicapped competitors, which also finished at the Halifax Peace Hall. Finally, on the 14th of April 1984, the Halifax Lions Club organised a mammoth swimathon at the Halifax Pool, which included a variety of aquatic activities. They also filmed the arrival of Richard Pater, a Methodist lay preacher who traced some of John Wesley's journeys on horseback around the country, publicizing a new visitor trail following the life and times of the great 18th century evangelist and promoting Calderdale's remarkable non-conformist heritage. The mounted Wesley was greeted by the mayor of Calderdale, Councillor John Bradley, himself a prominent local Methodist. Watched by local Methodist ministers, the Reverends John Munsey Turner and Michael Townsend, and crowds of well-wishers. He then visited the historic octagonal chapel at Heptonstall, only one of two surviving chapels of the design which Wesley himself had preferred during his lifetime. On Sunday, the 5th of August 1984, cine enthusiasts filmed a charity, It's a Knockout at Manor Heath, opened by the popular speedway ace Kenny Carter, who, two years after the event, died in tragic circumstances at the age of 24. Another popular charitable event organised by the Halifax Rotary Club was a charity bed race, which included some challenging obstacles. The summer of 1984, which provided an abundance of sunshine for outdoor activities, however resulted in a severe drought. Local reservoirs reached their lowest levels for many years, and hosepipe bans remained in place for months until supplies could be replenished. In 1985, the Halifax Cine Club filmed the arrival of local dignitaries for the opening of the Calderdale Industrial Museum in Winding Road, which included a range of working exhibits of machinery which had once kept local textile mills humming. Another popular new attraction opened in 1985, which took advantage of Halifax's naturally hilly terrain, was the Halifax Dry Ski Slope, near the Sportsman Inn although the inclement Halifax weather ensured that conditions on the opening day were rather wet. In September, the annual Sorby Bridge Rush Bearing Festival was filmed. A Victorian custom revived for the Silver Jubilee of Queen Elizabeth II in 1977. The festival included Morris dancing at the Maypole in Worley. And a visit to St John's Church, where the cart was blessed by the vicar canon Frank Carlos. After almost a century on Harrison Road, in premises which had opened in Halifax's Municipal Jubilee Year in 1898, a new police headquarters was constructed in Richmond Road. The Mayor and Mayoress and Canon Robert Gibson, Vicar of Halifax, were filmed arriving for the opening ceremony, attended by the Chief Constable of West Yorkshire, Colin Sampson. The wintry start to 1986 provided Halifax skiers with their first opportunity to use the newly constructed Halifax Dry Ski Slope in snow, and the cameras were there to film the action on the slopes.
On the 20th of April 1986, cameras were at Thrum Hall, where Halifax took Featherstone Rovers to a 13-all draw to become rugby league champions and claim the coveted league championship trophy for the first time in 21 years. The Duke of Wellington's regiment, which had been granted the freedom of the borough of Halifax in 1945, were permitted to march through the town with bayonets fixed, colours flying and bands playing on ceremonial occasions. Cine cameras recorded their march through the town in 1986, followed by a civic reception at Bankfield Museum. A growing concern for the victims of drought and famine in Africa following Bob Geldof's Band-Aid initiative in 1984 stimulated a number of local fundraising projects, including a Spare a Minute for Africa marathon run on the 25th of April 1986, in which both adults and children participated. The final Halifax Cine Club scrapbook of 1987 included film of the first visit of a series of visits to Calderdale on the 6th of February 1987 of Prince Charles, who, as president of business in the community, had made the town the focus of an innovatory community partnership with business, local government and the voluntary sector all working together to bring about regeneration. Prince Charles arrived 25 minutes earlier than expected and councillor David Fox, the borough's youngest mayor, had to dash through the crowds to greet the Prince of Wales at the offices of the Calderdale Inheritance Project in the old arcade. The Prince received a rapturous welcome at the Peace Hall from flag-waving crowds. And he strolled through the Friday market of the refurbished former cloth market, meeting traders and shoppers. In 1987, the Halifax Cine Club, moving away from the newsreel format, told the story of three ordinary citizens, who had each given their names to a public building and made a distinctive contribution to the life of the local community through the eyes of a young reporter for the local newspaper, David Chambers. The film, which was the brainchild of deputy town clerk Michael Scott, a keen local cine enthusiast, was filmed by Peter Holroyd, the club's secretary and archivist. The three ordinary citizens featured in the film, all local councillors who served as mayors of Halifax and subsequently received the freedom of the borough, were in reality quite extraordinary individuals. Laura Mitchell, a supervisor of clothing at a toffee factory, gave her name to a new health clinic opened in 1968. Frank Swire, member of the third generation of a Halifax family of chemists, opened the town's first purpose-built health centre at Nursery Lane, Ovenden in May 1971. Maurice Jagger, a slater and plasterer, raised over £60,000 in a public appeal for a new centre for the disabled and elderly, which opened in Winding Road in March 1982. The Constant Stream, a promotional video for the local tourist industry, produced for an international conference on tourism held at the North Bridge Leisure Centre in 1988, revealed the boost given to the service industry following the dramatic closure of carpet production at Dean Clough in 1982. By the end of the decade, more than half of Calderdale's workforce was employed in the service sector. Indeed, some 1,600 jobs were created in tourism alone in Calderdale in the 1980s, and by the end of the decade, tourism was worth around 17 million pounds per year to the local economy. And so, the willingness of local enthusiasts to experiment with a new medium of cinefilm from the early years of the century has provided local historians with a succession of vivid images reflecting the momentous changes affecting the lives of the people of Halifax in the 20th century. The first century in human history to bequeath to posterity filmed archives recording the life of a local community. <laughs>